without a captain. Being driven by an angry sea. But realize, oh God, that you said yes. every knee every must bow. Thank you. And every tongue must confess Thank you, Jesus. their own sins. <clears throat> we realize, Lord, that we've done wrong. And at this time, Father, we just ask for forgiveness Please, of our many sins. Yes, but not only that, Father, create in us a clean heart, renew in us, Lord, the right spirit. But most of all, Father, give us a forgiving heart. Lord, an understanding heart yes. that we'll be able to understand one from another. Yes. Before I go any further in prayer, Lord, I want to say thank you. Thank you. We thank you for what you've done last night. Thank you, Jesus. Stood by our bedside thank you, Jesus. all night long. And you didn't stop there. You told death to behave. You watched over us, Lord, all night long. And Father, we realized that every breath we took, we were just one breath away from death. But you kept us safe, Father, throughout the night. Wasn't awakened by no midnight alarm. Kept blood, Lord, moving in our veins. Yes. Kept this old heart, Lord. Yes. Mm. Beat at the right speed. Thank you, Jesus. Sometime early this morning, Father, mm. you touched us, Lord, mm. with a mighty hand of love. Mm. And Lord, you allowed our eyes to open one more time. You allow us to get up out of our bed. A bed which could have been our cooling boat. Yes. You allow us to see the rise of the sun Thank one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, all I can say is thank you. You didn't have to do that. But you look beyond all of our faults. You saw our needs. And you said, I'll give you one more chance. And for that, Father, we come with our hands, humble hearts. Just trying to return a few humble words of thanks. Realize that you're God all by yourself. All powers in your hand. Lord, all I can say is you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. But there again, we say thank you. Thank you. We're not going to extra leave you dwelling place. Yes, sir. But oh God, if you would just stop by here right now, oh, right I know if you stop by, you will deliver. You hear our cry. Thank you you answer our prayer. Thank you, Jesus. With this place has been set aside a long time ago. A place where prayers have went up and prayers have been answered. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I feel good. And I'm thanking you right now. Look down upon our land and our country. This old war torn world we live in. And Lord, please, our Father. Yes. Don't forget about this church family. Yes. Hold them, Lord, in the heart of your hands. Right from every heart. Somebody will say thank you. Thank you. Don't forget about the men who stand in John's shoes. Go wear it down, Lord, in your storehouse of knowledge. Allow my pride to decrease, but let the Holy Spirit increase. Please, Father, do that. If it's your will, please, Father. You 
said, if we need you, call you by your name. Only name I know is Jesus. Please, our Father. Don't let our coming together be coming together in vain. Don't let our praying be praying in vain. And then, Father, remember those who have forgotten to pray for us. You know, Lord. Yes. And we go in the last mile away. We go in our room for the last time. And we won't have to come out no more. Our troubles will be over. All we ask for others give us a home. Somewhere, Lord. We just want to be close to you. Where you can wipe the tears away from our eyes. This is your service, praise. Greetings once again, my beloved, on this, our Lord's Day, as I welcome you here uh, to First African Baptist, uh, located at 601 U Street, downtown, beautiful behind the infamous chocolate tree. I welcome you to our sermon as we continue on the Romans Road. Uh, we're traveling down Romans' second chapter right now, and we will be covering verses 11 through 15. My name is uh, Pastor Alexander McBride, and I have the privilege to pastor, uh, a 16th pastor of, of, of this grandmother church for over 155 years. And once this pandemic is over with, my love, I invite you to come out and wish it with us. Our services began at, at 10 a.m., Sunday school to 11 a.m., and then from 11 a.m., or I would say 11, 15 a.m., until about 1 o'clock, uh, there, will, there will be our worship service. So when this is all said and done, please come on out and if you do not have a church on, consider us. And the only prerequisite that we have that you be a part of us is that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And He is for my brother and you are my sister. And I thank God for you. Okay. Now, uh, as we go on, I would be remiss if I did not read scripture have prayer, then we'll get into our lesson. Our scripture comes from the second chapter of Romans. If you open your Bibles to that, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. And we will be reading from the 11th verse. Okay. Now we know that on the last Lord's Day we talked about uh, the four criteria God employs in final judgment. Okay. Uh, the fourth criteria, which are deeds. Deeds of the righteous, and we talked about the deeds of the unrighteous also. The first three of the six criteria God will employ in final judgment. The first three is knowledge, we find that in verse 1, truth, verses 2 and 3, and guilt, verses 4 and 5. Then the second three are deeds, impartiality, and Motive deeds, Romans 2, 6 through 10, part impartiality, verses 11 through 15, and motive, verse 16. And since we've discussed God's judgment concerning the deeds on last Lord's day of the righteous and unrighteous, uh, this is some, these are some of the things that we made clear that the subjective, subjective, the more with feelings, the subjective criteria for salvation is faith and faith alone, with nothing else added. But the objective reality of that salvation is made known and manifest in the subsequent godly works that the Holy Spirit leads and empowers the believers to perform. So you have the subjective and the objective. And the reason is, God looks at the heart, but man looks on the outer appearance. And that which is written on your heart will manifest itself through your actions in and out of appearance. Amen? Amen. I mean, I can say I'm saved all day, but if I do not produce works of that salvation, not for works of that salvation, then I'm just speaking in vain. So for that reason, good deeds are perfectly valid uh, uh, for God's judgment. And we said that faith in Christ does not produce freedom to sin and to do as we please, but freedom from sin and a new God-given desire 
and ability and capacity to do what pleases him. Then, just, just for you a little bit, we also stated that the three characteristics of the unredeemed is that they are selfishly ambitious, that they do not obey the truth, and that they obey unrighteousness. No person lives in a moral and spiritual vacuum. Christ said, no one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to the one and despise God. He said that in, in Matthew 6 to 24. And, and from that, it can be deduced that no man serves no master. I said that right. No man serves no master. You either serve God or you serve yourself and the devil. No man serves no master. You serve somebody. Now, we'll wrap it up by discussing the principles of impartiality and the motive of God's judgment. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for how you have blessed us and is blessing us even now. Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the honor to come before these, your people, to project to them your word. Lord, I ask that you give me the ability to project it in soundness of doctrine, that I will be able to give it with a kind uh, and a cheerful heart, but with boldness and courage also. Lord, forgive me of my sins and forgive these, your children, of their sins, Lord. And I ask that you touch the leaders of our country, Lord God, from the president on down, Lord, we are in need of mercy now, as Prince uh, said. So, Lord, have mercy, because mercy is what we stand in need of. Father, please touch our president, touch all of those in leadership in the Senate and Congress, and all those uh, that have to do with governing our lives, Lord God. Please give them wisdom. And then, oh Lord, please, uh, I ask you to touch the sick and the shut-in, not only those of, uh, that are here at FAB, but those at other churches out there, out there, and out there. And then, Lord, when it's finally said and done, let all that we do and all that we say honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, before I read uh, um, the scripture, a lesson that we're going to cover, as I say, from verse 11 to verse 15 of chapter 2. I, I was going over my daily devotion and I saw this thing by Oswald Chambers, uh, uh, my utmost for his eyes. If you don't have that book, it's a book of daily devotions for 365 days of the year. It is an inspiring and a thought provoking book. And the one that I read was When Thou Was Under the Fig Tree, Jesus said, I saw thee, John 1 and 48. And this is what Oswald uh, Chambers said about them. And listen carefully, please. He said, We imagine we would be all right if a big crisis arose. But the big crisis would only reveal the stuff we're made of, it would not put anything into us. If God gives the call, of course I will rise to the occasion. You will not unless you have risen to the occasion in the workshop. Unless you have been the real thing before God in the workshop. If you're not doing the right thing that lies nearest because God has engineered it, when the crisis comes, instead of being revealed, as fit, you will be revealed as unfit. What am I talking about? What is he talking about? Crisis always reveal character. How you go through something proves to others, yourself, and God who you are. The private relationship, private relationship, emphasis on private, the private relationship of worshiping God is the great essential of fitness. The time comes when there is no more fig tree life possible. You don't just lay around leisure and the fig tree for anymore. When it is out into the open, out into the glare, and into the work and into the world, you will find yourself of no value there if you have not been worshiping as occasion serves you in your home. 
Worship a right in your private relationships that when God sets you free, you'll be ready because in the unseen life, which no one saw but God, you have become perfectly fit. And when the strain comes, the strain of affliction comes, you can be relied on by God. I can't be expected to live a sanctified life in the circumstances I am in. I have no time for praying just now. No time for Bible reading. My opportunity hasn't come. And when it does, of course, I'll be all right. No, you will not. If you've not been worshiping as occasion serves in your home, in private, when you get into work, you will not only be useless uh, to yourself, but a tremendous hindrance to those who are associated with you. The workshop of missionary munitions is the hidden personal worshiping life of the saint. And all of that is saying, you worship at home, so when you get out in public, you know how to worship you. And you can tell if you pray at home, you know how to pray in public. You don't be stumbling over your words for the most part. You don't be reaching out there uh, and, and just grabbing anything. God bless the whole world. Yeah, I mean, He is going to bless the whole world. But in blessing the whole world, you're praying in, uh, 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 in, in, in prayer, uh, 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 we call it in predication, in prayer of cursing. Because in order for God to bless the whole world, He first has to destroy the whole world. Okay? I, mean, I just wanted to read that to you. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. So, let's get into today's lesson. I will read to you from the King James Version, second chapter, starting at the 11th verse. But there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall he be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or, ex or else excusing one another. And God has blessed to the readers and hearers of His Holy Writ. Now, we're going to start uh, and finish up impartiality and our motive here. And in reading the part about impartiality, that's 2, 11 through 15. I'm not going to reread that because it was read, right? So, let's talk about this fifth element uh, uh, related to God's judgment. That is his impartiality. Prosopoleptes. Partiality means to receive a face. That is, to give consideration to a person because of who they are. That exact idea is seen, it is seen in a popular symbolic statue of justice as a woman blindfolded, it, signifying that she is unable to see who is before her to be judged. Therefore, it's not tempted to be partial either for or against the accused. I just wish it was so. Sometimes she's also pictured with her hands tied, suggesting she cannot receive a bride. I wish it was so. Unfortunately, though, there is partiality even in the best of human courts, but there will be no partiality in God's day of judgment. Why? Because of his perfect knowledge of every detail of our life and because of his perfect righteousness in doing the right thing, it is not possible for his justice to be anything but perfectly impartial. Such things as position, education, influence, popularity, or physical appearance will have absolutely no bearing on God's decision concerning a person's eternal destiny. The most magnificent and exalted creature God made was Lucifer himself, the star of the morning, the sun of the dawn. But because of his prideful ambition to raise himself even above his creator, to make himself like the most high, even the high-ranking 
majestic Lucifer was cast out of heaven by God to hell. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. And what was the temptation that he put before man? You shall be like God. The most exalted became the most debased. If ever there was a being whose position merited special favor before God, it was Lucifer. But his high position instead made him more accountable for his evil rebellion. And that's the main focus of what we're talking about today, accountability. We will be held accountable. And he therefore will receive the greatest punishment of any creature ever in hell. And that quality of justice is also implied in the apostle's declaration that God is not mocked for whatever a man plants, that he'll also read. Whatever he sow, he's going to read. Galatians 6 and 7. Who a person is will have no bearing at all on what he reads in God's judgment. And look at what he said, and it's very fair. Everybody said, I want it to be fair. The one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And that's in verse 8. God's impartiality does not exclude his taking into account the very, the very spiritual life that people have. Now, Paul mentioned two distinct groups of sinners, those who have not had opportunity to know God's law and those who have had such opportunity. He's speaking, of course, about the law given through Moses to the people of Israel. Those without the law are therefore the Gentiles. So it's classified into two parts, Jews and Gentiles, as he's been talking here. He, he described the, the uh, atrocities of the Gentiles, and then he is describing the atrocities of the Jews. It is not that the Gentiles have no awareness of God or sense of right and wrong. The apostle has already established that through the evidence of creation. All men have witness of God's eternal power and divine nature, according to verse 20 of chapter 1. Gentiles who have sinned without the law of Moses will therefore also perish without the law of Moses. That is, they will be judged according to their more limited knowledge of God. And that, of course, includes the vast majority of humanity at all times. You know, even with the increased ability to distribute God's word in the various languages around the world, even now, virtually over these telecasts, and the remarkable new techniques and media for preaching the gospel, most people in the world today have never heard clear teaching from the Bible, much less grasp clear knowledge of its saving truth. Sound doctrine is a rare thing in most churches these days. But because they have God's natural revelation and creation, as well as the witness of right and wrong in their hearts and conscience, verse 15, they are guilty and accountable. They will therefore perish without the law. A probably perish pertains to destruction, but not annihilation. The Jehovah's Witness talks about a total annihilation and some religions teach when you're dead, you're dead, you just evaporate into nothing. No, after death comes the judgment. It basically has to do with that which is ruined and is no longer usable for its intended purpose. That is the term Jesus used to speak of those who are thrown into Gehenna, into hell, into hell fire. Matthew 10 and 28. As he makes clear elsewhere, hell is not a place or state of nothingness or unconscious existence as is taught by the Hindus of, of Nirvana. It is the place of everlasting torment, my beloved. The place of eternal death where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll be grinding your teeth. Matthew 13, 42, 50. With everything in your mind that you remember, woulda, shoulda, coulda. All people are created by God for His glory. But when they refuse to come to Him for salvation, they lose their opportunity for redemption. For becoming what God intends for them to be. They are then fit only for condemnation and destruction. And condemnation is a legal term. God and God alone condemns. 
The lost Gentile would just as surely perish as the lost Jew. But as Paul has already uh, uh, stated in verse 9, their eternal tribulation and distress will be less than that of the Jews who have had the immeasurable advantage of, of possessing God's law. Jesus stated that principle very clear. Using the illustration of the slaves of a master who returned after a long journey, he said, that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes. But the ones who did not know and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but a few lashes. But from everyone who has been given much shall much be required, and to whom they entrusted much of him they will ask all the more. Luke 12, 47 and 48. It is the Jew, it is the Jew, those to whom the Lord had entrusted much, whom the apostle addressed next, declaring that all who have sinned under the law of Moses will be judged by the law of Moses. The person who has not had the benefit of knowing God's law will be judged according to his limited knowledge of God. But the person who has access to God's law will be judged according to his greater knowledge about the Lord. Those who have knowledge not only of the Old Testament law, but also of the New Testament gospel are also included in this second category of those who are judged. And because they have even greater knowledge of God than the ancient Jews, they will be held still even more accountable. Dealing with that word accountable, dealing with accountability. They will be like the Jewish cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, which had heard Jesus' teaching and witnessed his miracles, but had rejected him as their Messiah and King. They not only had God's law, but they had been privileged to meet God's only Son to stare God in the face. The Lord scathingly told them it would be better for them in the day of judgment than the pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon and Sodom than for them, Matthew 11, 20 and 23. And although all unbelievers will be there, the hottest part of hell will be reserved for those who have wasted the greatest spiritual opportunity. Isn't that something? The hottest part of hell will be reserved for those who have wasted the greatest spiritual opportunity. Now, I'm here to tell you, my love, as often as you go to church, and if you're listening to sound doctrine, and you've heard sound preaching, the more you reject it, the harder your heart gets, and the more flammable you become. It is such a fearful thing to be an apostate as somebody that falls away, one who has known and even acknowledge God's truth, but ultimately turn their back on it. I'm not talking about somebody losing their salvation. You can't. I'm talking about somebody that has not never been saved in the first place, but they have heard uh, everything Jesus had to say. All of those who have the opportunity to hear God's word have a great advantage above those who do not have such an opportunity. If they fail to heed his words, they are much worse off than those others. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, Paul says, but the doers of the law will be justified. And just as James does in his warning uh, you know, about those who hear God's word, but don't do it in James 1, 22 through 20, uh, 23, not the hearers on it, but the doers. Show me your faith uh, without works, I show you my faith by my word. Paul here does not use the usual Greek term for hearing, uh, akoye, but the word Croatus, which you know, which was used of those whose business it is to listen. The idea is much like that of a college student. His primary purpose in class is to listen to the teacher's instruction. And normally, he is also has the responsibility of being accountable for what he hears because they're being tested on. If he simply is in there just to audit, he is required only to attend the class, but not worry about the class. He takes no tests, he receives no grades. In other words, he listens without being held accountable for what he hears. And in many synagogues during Paul's time, 
and in many churches today, teaching did not focus on scripture, but on the system of man-made traditions, newspaper gospels, social gospels, what the president did, what this person did, and what that person did. Don't you know the world is operating just like it's supposed to operate? Unsaved people act unsaved. Don't expect anything different. God's word in the Old Testament was merely read and listened to without explanation, without any application. And most Jews, therefore, were simply auditing the course. Hearers of the law, but doing nothing. Just like a lot of folks in, in, in different churches hearing the word of God, if they are hearing the word of God, and doing nothing. But God recognizes uh, 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 no mere auditors of his word. He don't recognize these auditors. The more a person hears his truth, the more he is responsible for believing and obeying that truth. Unless there is obedience, the greater the hearing, the greater the judgment. People who only think they are Christians merely because they do such things as going to church, paying money, listening to sermon tape, participating in neighborhood watches, Bible studies, and listening to Christian music only delude themselves. James warns, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgot what kind of person he was. James 1, 23 and 24. In other words, a person who is satisfied with superficially knowing God's word is living a spiritual illusion, thinking he is saved when he is not. And it is hard to tell an unsaved person they're unsaved when they think they're saved. By looking in a mirror, he judges himself by himself rather than by the word of God that he knows much about but does not take to heart. His failure, her failure to obey what they hear proves they do not believe it or accept it. They continue to hold grudges. They continue to hate family. They continue to cause discord. Their, or dis their disobedience proves they do not trust in the God whose word they hear. And the more they hear without obeying, the more they pile up guilt against themselves on the day of judgment. Our Lord certainly had uh, his son on his mind when he preached uh, the conclusion of the sermon on the mount in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Let, let, let me uh, 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 recite that to you. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was it fall. Notice, same situation, different foundations. The doers of the law, on the other hand, are those who come to God in repentance and faith, realizing that his law is impossible for them to keep apart from him, and that knowledge of it places them under greater obligation to obey it. The true doers of God's law are those who come to Jesus Christ in faith because the purpose of the law is to lead men to him. Galatians 3 and 24. And after they have come to him in faith, their obedience, uh, uh, their obedient lives give evidence of their saving relationship to him. Let me say that again. After they have come to faith, uh, 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 come to Christ in faith, their obedient lives gives evidence of their saving relationship to him and of the fact that they will be and are justified. The idea here is not that obeying the law will produce justification because scripture makes it clear that justification comes only through faith, Romans 3, 24 and 28, but they will be demonstrated to be just by the evidence of their doing of God's holy law. Again, Paul is pointing to the same truth as James in regard to the relationship between faith and works. 
And also like James is used of justification in the sense of completed or perfected salvation. The person who genuinely obeys God's word proves by his divinely empowered obedience that he is saved and thereby will be recognized as justified on the day of judgment. James 2, 20 and 26. Does that mean then that Gentiles are excused from eternal judgment and punishment because they have not had the advantage of the law and therefore has no basis for obedient living? By no means, my beloved. No, because as Paul has already established, the Gentiles, that is those that do not have the law, have God's general or natural revelation of himself in creation and know instinctively that they are guilty and worthy of death. 1, 18 through 32. But does not Paul say later in his epistle, but there is no law, neither is there violation, 4, 15, and that until the law, sin was not in the world, but sin that, uh, is not imputed, but there is no law, 5, 13, and I would not have come to no sin except through the law, 7 and 7. Anticipating those kinds of questions, Paul here states that Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law being the law to themselves. Explain further, the apostle says, they show the work of the law written in their hearts and their conscience bears witness. You know how your conscience kick in, right? And their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them, depending on how your conscience was taught. There are four reasons by the heathen of all. First, as already noted, their rejection of their knowledge of God, available through his creation, condemns them. Second, as the apostle now points out, their conduct based on the knowledge of the law written in their hearts condemns them. Throughout history, there have been many unbelievers who have been honest in business. They have been respectful of their parents. They have been faithful to their wives or husbands, caring of their children, and generous to those in need, all of which good things God's words commend. God's standard of judgment is reflected in many secular judicial systems where stealing, murder, and various uh, other forms of immorality are considered wrong and made illegal. Many pagan philosophies, both ancient and modern, teach certain standards of ethics that closely parallel, parallel those things that's taught in the Bible. The Bible reports many good deeds done by pagans, such as Darius in Daniel 6, 25-28, the city clerk of Ephesus, Acts 19, 35-41, the Roman military officers who protected Paul, Acts 23, 17-35, and the natives of Malta who defended Paul and his shipmates in Acts 28 and 10. The fact that such people did good things, knowing they were ethically good, proves they had knowledge of God's law written in their hearts. Oh my goodness. Let me say that one more time. The fact that people do good things, knowing that the good things they do are ethically good, this only proves that they have a knowledge of God's law written in their hearts. And because of this, if those people never come to trust in the true God, their good deeds will actually witness against them on the day of judgment. And so many people said, may the work I've done speak for me. The work of many will speak for them. And Christ will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Third, the heathen are condemned because of their conscience. Gentiles who do not have the privilege of knowing God's law, nevertheless have a conscience bearing witness to his law. So needless this, conscience literally means knowledge with or co-knowledge, consigns with knowledge. Synonyms of that term most with the same root meaning are found in many ancient languages. And the very idea behind the word testifies to the fact that men recognize they have an instinctive, built-in sense of right and wrong that activates that guilt. Conscience is very in sensitivity, I know that, depending on the degree of one's knowledge of and feeling about what's right and wrong. The person who has considerable knowledge of God's word will have a more sensitive conscience than someone who has never had opportunity to know scripture. A conscience also very in sensitivity, depending on whether they are obeyed 
for resisting and doing that. In doing that, the Bible said that conscience becomes seared as with a hot iron. And I'll give you an example, my beloved. You know, some years ago, we talked about uh, uh, the, the gross uh, med medical thinking that the gross disfiguration of the extremities of leprosy uh, was caused directly by the disease. But I'm here to tell you, my beloved, leprosy does not deteriorate or eat at the flesh, but rather it desensitizes the nerves. And unprotected by the warning signals of pain, the leper wears down his extremities or suffers cuts, burns, and infections without knowing he has been injured. In much the same way, the neglected and resistant conscience becomes more insensitive and eventually may stop giving warning signals about wrongdoing. If you no longer get those warning signals about wrongdoing, my beloved, it's time to get worried. Paul speaks of heretics and apostates in the last days whose conscience could be desensitized as if cauterized by a hot iron because of their persistent opposition to God and his truth. You find that in 1 Timothy 4.2. God uses the conscience of his children as vehicles for his guidance. Let me say it again. God uses our consciences as vehicles for his guidance. Paul therefore makes many appeals for believers to be faithful to the leading of their own conscience and to respect the conscience of other believers. Consistent with his own teaching, the apostle was careful to obey his own conscience. You find that backed up in Acts 23 and Romans 9. Four, the heathen are lost because of their contemplation. Their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. You know, this natural faculty is closely related to the conscience. Building on the instinctive knowledge of right and wrong that the conscience provides, even unbelievers have the obvious ability to determine that certain things are basically right or wrong. And that's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom is the courage to do the right thing, the ability to recognize right and wrong, and the courage to do what's right. Many ardent crime fighters and advocates for the poor, for example, do not get their motivation from scripture or from a saving relationship to Jesus Christ. As human beings, they simply cannot help uh, but know that opposing crime and helping the poor are good things to do. Even the most godless, godless society becomes incensed when a child or elderly person is brutally attacked or murdered, even, uh, uh, even pagans. Amen? Even, 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 the, uh, uh, even the pagans and agnostics and atheists are able to discern, to discern basic right and wrong. And for those four profound reasons that I just stated, no person can stand guiltless before God's judgment. The fact that they do not turn to God proves they do not live up to the light God has given them. Jesus declared categorically, if any man is willing to do his will, God's will, he shall know the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. John 7, 17. Paul assured his pagan listeners in Athens that God made for one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Acts 17, 26 to 27. The person who genuinely seeks to know and follow God is divinely assured that they will succeed. You will seek me and find me, the Lord said, when you search me, uh, search for me with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29 and 13. You'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Now let's talk about Romans 216. On the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. This sixth principle of God's judgment is that of motive. Here Paul makes clear that he is speaking about the final judgment, the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge. 
motive is a valid basis for judgment only because God is able to judge the secrets of men's hearts through Jesus Christ because the Lord infallibly knows every person's motives for doing the things they do. He can infallibly judge whether or not those deeds are truly good or bad, whether they come from the flesh or from the Holy Spirit. David, you know, counseled his son Solomon to serve God with a whole heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. That's First Chronicles 28 In one of his most beautiful songs, David confessed, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou hast, thou do know me when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou do understand my thoughts from afar off. Thou do scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted in all my ways. That's Psalms 139, 1 and 3. There is obviously such a thing as relative human goodness. Many unbelievers live on a high moral plane compared to a whole lot of other people. But that is not the kind of goodness that satisfies God because nothing is truly good that is done from any motive other than His glory and done in any power except His own. Let me say that one more time, okay? Nothing is truly good that is done from any motive other than his glory and done in a power but his own. Everything that is done in the flesh can only serve the flesh and is by nature tainted with imperfection and self-interest. It cannot be done out of the only right motive, that of pleasing and glorifying God. Whether done to impress others with one's goodness, to react to peer pressure, to alleviate uh, guilty feelings, or simply to feel better about yourself. Anything that is not done for God and through His power is basically sinful and unacceptable to Him. No matter how outwardly good and self-sacrificial it may appear to be. David committed terrible sins while he served as God's anointed king of God's chosen nation. As noted in, in, uh, in the previous chapter, many of his sins, such as adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah, were capital offenses for which God could justly have demanded David's life. But the basic motive and direction of David's life were not selfish ambition and unrighteous, but the service and worship of God. He readily acknowledged and confessed his sins before God, throwing himself on, on the Lord's mercy and grace. And let me point out to you, my beloved, an apology is not repentance. Saying I'm sorry is not repentance. Repentance is when you recognize a thing is wrong, you face it face to face, you stop doing it, you turn the other way, dedicated to not doing that anymore. And when you turn away from the wrong, you turn to the righteous, Jesus Christ. Amen? So don't confuse apologies with repentance. Judas, on the other hand, although outwardly upright and religious and professed follower of Jesus Christ, was thoroughly self-centered. Inwardly, he came to have contempt for Christ and his gospel of grace. The heart desires that move those two men were open books to the Lord, and their respected guilt and deeds would be judged for what they truly were and not the way they appeared to other folks. If Romans 2, uh, 6 through 16 teaches anything, it teaches that a redeemed life will produce holy living. It teaches that a redeemed life will produce holy living, and that a life that reflects no holy living has no claim on eternal life with Christ. Right living, which can only come from right motivation, is the God-given evidence of genuine salvation. Right living, which can only come from right motivation, is the God-given evidence of genuine salvation. Lack of right living is just a certain evidence of a person being lost. So look in the mirror. Don't forget what you look like when you come away. Am I doing the right thing with the right motives? Or am I doing this just for my own self? And if you find it is, my love, repent. Don't just say I'm sorry. 
I'm just crying the crocodile too. Turn from your evil ways and turn to Jesus Christ. So until next time, my beloved, Yvette Cordell, live from the face. In the book of the gospel according to Mark, Jesus went over into the country of the Gadarenes. That was a man who was possessed by at least 2,000 demonic spirits. They could not bind him with chains nor with fetters. And fetters were simply a mechanism that was designed to hold the feet. Sometimes your hands can be free. But if your feet are bound, you still cannot walk into the blessings of God. But I want you to know tonight that it does not matter what kind of fetter, what kind of chain the enemy has imposed upon you. Jesus brings every fetter. Oh, why don't you ring it out? Jesus breaks every fetter. Jesus breaks every fetter. And he said, Jesus breaks every fetter. of how he broke the chains of bondage yesterday it doesn't matter what satan tries to do today i will never doubt my savior i will never doubt Set me free. He set me free. He set me free.